Welcome to the Mirror Talks podcast, where we deconstruct some of humanity's most disconnecting and limiting assumptions and offer an alternative, a free state of consciousness, unbiased, naturally wise, and genuinely loving. We will shed a more enlightened perspective on everyday experiences to help anyone willing realize their true potential and inspire a contemporary spiritual life lift in service to all. Say goodbye to the man-made paradigms of distorted ideas. Let's become pure, free, and actually intelligent once again. We just finished having a beautiful conversation with our good friend, Anurag Gupta. Bentinho and Anurag have been teaching together for years and getting involved in various projects together. Um, and Anurag came to visit us for a few days. So we got the chance to have him on the podcast. And it was just such a cool, beautiful, different dynamic than you've seen on other episodes. Bentinho and Anurag really have a, just a, a, a beautiful, precise, mutual respect for each other, despite all their differences and all their different approaches. But they just have this cool connection that you can feel. It's visceral. Um, a lot of the topics that we get into even sort of delineate this and, um, and just show that a mutual commitment to something bigger than yourself in service to others, um, a, a complete passion for authenticity and for... Um, just that self inquiry, that mastering where you're coming from instead of where you're trying to get to or what you're trying to strategize and create as an outcome, just this sort of simple prioritization of what really matters, how this can bring two totally different people together and how, and how we, you can really, it's like all paths lead to Rome and you really get a, a tangible sample of that in this conversation. So we cover a ton of ground, tons of different topics, but it's all, it's all just rich with the same potent message. So I'm not going to tell you what that message is, but I know you're going to love it. This is just one of those beautiful, special one-off conversations that I can't wait for you guys to enjoy. Welcome everyone to another episode of Mirror Talks. Corey. Hello, welcome. And we have a new, not so new friend on the show today, which is Anurag Gupta. Um, again, a hard man to introduce, but some of you, probably many of you already uh, have seen his face um, during some of the recordings of my retreats. We've been teaching together for a while on and off. We've done some of our um, kind of private, smaller group workshops together um, for maybe three years. Yeah, about that. Like that. Yeah. Anurag's been in um, similar fields as my own, more towards personal development. Um, well, name a few key terms, maybe. Things yeah, that I mean, I mean, in personal and organizational transformation, personal development, you know, high performance approaches that are based mm -hmm. in high values and integrity, different things around that. Cool. Both business and... Business and yeah. personal. Yeah. Sweet. So you've been doing that for what, like, almost 30 years. Yeah, 27 years. So a lot of, uh, when I met Anurag, um, it's always, uh, just quite frankly, I think for everybody, but for me also, it, it takes a little, it takes a little time to kind of get used to, like, you know, he's speaking fast and just the way he shows up. So when I was kind of scanning him, for lack of a better word, when a friend introduced us, you know, it took me maybe five, 10 minutes to kind of get a feel for the man behind the words. Um, but once I did, I saw some brilliance and uh, recognized some kinship as well, similarities on the journey, similar values um, about integrity and honesty and courage and dedication to the mission. Because typically when I meet people and there's some kind of a scanning involved, like someone wants to get onto a project or says they want to work with us or a friend introduces us, then if it is, for lack of a better word, work related or like mission related, or it has to do somehow with the work that I do or whatever we can share in that field, um, my radar is always pretty, you know, on, uh, on high alert. And what it's scanning for is, is this person about themselves? Or is this person actually about 
the, for lack of a better word, again, mission? Is the person about the mission? Is it about service to others? Or is this person, they just have like a cool idea, or they just think they have a cool idea, or they think they're cool, or they're enjoying hearing themselves speak. And it's just become sort of this, this monkey show. Um, so you get a lot of these people, no offense, that, you know, benefit a lot of people, I'm sure, to some degree. But when it comes to really being able to trust them, like at a core level, uh, something's missing. It's just too much about the self. And it's too little about that devotion and courage and dedication towards others. So that's the perfect way to frame Anurag, actually. I think that's what you guys have in common more than anything else is, as Anurag says in his words, is constituting yourselves as the vision or as the bigger picture. I do think that is the one sort of most unifying factor between the two of you. I think otherwise you have like almost nothing in common besides uh, <laughs> cigars. <laughs> what, what more do you need? <laughs> the mom did say, he's this guy and I'm the earth and they go, oh, okay, we get it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Earth and sky, that's right. So then after about 10 minutes or so of kind of having a dialogue with them, and I just felt that, oh, this, not only is this guy pretty clever, smart, and strategic, uh, but he's deploying that in a way that's not self-serving, which is rare. Like typically people that are strategic or they have strong intellect, it's very difficult to find someone that is very strategically oriented uh, in business, personal life, whatever it is. Um, yet at the same time, have that be rooted in a heart that's essentially selfless. So I was delighted when I started to feel and glimpse that from him just speaking and us dialoguing. Um, so then he came over to our office and anyway, lots of stuff happened. And then we <laughs> kind of started sort of <laughs> teaching together, a lot of overlap mm -hmm. uh, in our work, actually. The, the other thing that I found is that as he came to our office and he did a workshop with our, um, with our crew, I noticed also content related and, and way of working and way of seeing and way of approaching people and way of reading people. And right, there was a lot of similarity there, even though quite, quite a few different methodologies and like backgrounds, but still the overlap, the essence in the overlap felt very good. And so then I invited him to one of the retreats and he pretty much took over because I, <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I kind of gave up on that retreat. Yeah. Um, and then his energy pulled my energy back in and then we, had a pretty awesome um, first sort of experience together. Mm. And That's, after that, we've just done some more exclusive private group workshop things together. And it's been a blast. Anyway, it was really cool to have that experience and uh, be able to share that with you. So anyway, welcome. Long introduction, non-introduction, introduction. Here we are. So what's a nice starting point? Uh, well, I think it'd be cool to hear a little bit from Rags on Arag just about what you're up to and what you're, what you're constituting yourself as. Hmm. So I'm as, I have as a hard time describing what I'm up to as you do. <laughs> <laughs> um, and not, it's not, not about being elusive, but it's like when you fully throw yourself, more my view is when you fully throw yourself into what is really there, then it goes outside and beyond language. You know? So then I drop, from my, my experience, so I'm gonna reduce what it is by putting it in language and I will do so. And then everybody will wander into their own interpretations of it. But um, I would say it's about the rebalancing or harmonization of, of the planet. What do you mean by that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, see, you, know, you gotta <laughs> interpret that. <laughs> well, all right, I'll tell the story and see if we can shape it. Right. So in, 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 for a period of time, I was working in a linear manner on what I thought, what I called in my mind, like the, the transformation of life on the planet, but it had a, it was not a whole, it didn't include the earth. It was linear. It was people based. It was, you know, uh, it was, you know, it was, it was a, an extrapolation, a linear extrapolation, right? And um, it, it, it actually, in the, the lie in it was, is there's this body of work, which a lot of people who have read have even gotten, ah, oh, I see when you get there, you get there's nowhere to get. But I was still working inside of a model where there's somewhere to get, 
right? Which actually, even, <laughs> which is, you know, one of the funny things in this work, people will come and say, hey, help us get to that place where there's nowhere to get. It's just a, a little funny. But anyways, mm -hmm. we'll come back to that. So um, one time I was uh, sitting on a weekend with my colleague, Richard, and he was, uh, he said, hey, I want you to look at this work from this guy. He's called the Terministic Screen, right? And um, it's, it's not a complex thought. It's basically you have a set of terms and you look at the world through that screen of those terms. So if you looked at this room from the terms of an interior decorator, you would see one set of things. If you looked at it from the terms of an architect, you would see other things, right? And so you have a screen, a terministic screen through, then that causes your view. And then it's all there in language, right? And it's neither good nor bad. Having a, one set of terms allows you to see things that, you know, that you might not otherwise see, but it also doesn't allow you to see other things outside of that screen. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So we were sitting there and we're doing this work. And as you know, I throw my, like to throw myself in. And so Richard said, hey, how about if we pulled out all the work we've done over decades and throw all the terms out? And we did. And we got, that was really exciting because what was just left was the intentions we want to fulfill, you know, the cons what we're constituted as. And I said, wow, that's really cool. Just the intention. If I throw out all the terms, I throw out all the processes that I've learned from others that I've even developed myself. Wow, that's great. We should do that on a regular basis because then you can keep having a fresh start. And nothing gets sacred. You know, nothing gets institutionalized, all that stuff, right? So I did all of that and I'm sitting there just, and I was all lit up about just the intention. And then I go, damn. Even intention is a term. See, I thought that was like not, oh, and that really messed me up because my entire work is based in intention. And, um, and I just suddenly had, I had no resistance letting everything else go. And then it was just letting intention go. Was suddenly, it was eight in the evening and suddenly I was really <laughs> sleepy. <laughs> so I, I got to go to bed. <laughs> so I went upstairs, my house in Vancouver, and I went to bed. And I kept waking up and going to bed, sleep and waking up. Kept meditating on letting go, letting go, letting go. Intention, I just didn't want to because my whole identity was based in it, right? All of my work, everything people love. And so then finally one moment, I just let, let it go. And then there was nothing. There's actually nothing. And, and it was, well, it's like this, it was just really quiet, right? It was just <laughs> like nothing. So this is what's funny. So like, and, 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 some people who know my work will still, you know, think from intention and calling as you know, whatever, but, but really, and I'm bringing something forth that I haven't done that much work with people because I haven't got a reliable yet way to get it to everybody, but here's what it is. And the answer to your question authentically. So I, I suddenly found myself early in the morning, sitting up in bed, exactly this. I was just sitting there and I suddenly noticed I was sitting in bed doing this. <laughs> I looked down at myself and. And I had this experience of being like a two-year-old <laughs> and just going, do, 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 do. like, oh, that's what it's like. You know, you're just like, you know, there's nothing going on. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I was just like, I was just doing that. And I kind of felt like that. There was nothing in my head. I was like, do, 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 do. And I go, oh, that's kind of funny. So then. I think people by now are ready to sign up for your workshop. <laughs> <laughs> if I had one. <laughs> if you had one. Yeah. So I'm sitting there, uh, you know, um, Corey, and then, uh, so things are like really quiet. And I go, this is interesting. If I have no, let all the words go. You know, so then I thought, I'm going to test this out. So I turned on the TV and I turned on the news because there's all sorts of things I normally would judge, right? And then, and as I turned it on, and if I let all terms go, there was just nothing. There was no judgment. There was no reaction. Just stuff. I go, that's kind of interesting. Cool. So then I turned it off and I sat there for a while and suddenly I had to pee. She got up, peed, started to walk back to the bed from the bathroom and then I noticed that my toothpaste thing, which normally is a standing thing, was over on its side. So then I picked up the toothpaste thing and I put it upright, walked back to bed. And then I asked myself, why did I do that? If there's no turn, like, I didn't think, you get what I'm saying? I didn't have words. I didn't assess it as right or wrong. I just did it. And I became intensely curious about why did I do that? So I started to meditate on that. And then this crazy thing happened, which is a whole bunch of sequences of, of things 
popped into my mind and a whole bunch of things linked together. And uh, I'm just going to share because the one that I remember the most vividly was, I don't know if any of you have seen it, but there's a video on YouTube, or there was a while ago, of, um, of this dog. Uh, there, was a, there was a bunch of fish on a, on a pier, on a dock, right, flopping around, and his dock trying to push water onto them to save them. And I, I saw all of this thing, like in a fabric of nature, which is, oh, um, when, so this dog was not a hungry dog. It was a domestic dog, so it wasn't hungry. So therefore, when it wasn't hungry, it didn't want to eat the fish. It wanted to save them, right? And so that was the one that's most vividly there and a bunch of other things that I noticed in nature and other things. And what I got was is that in the absence of all of these terms and everything and just pure being, what nature, what we want is harmony, do you get what I'm saying? Just like there's a heart, like to, to rebalance things. Here it was trying to, and why I put that toothpaste, like with no, without thinking in that, there's just a pull. If we don't have this, we don't have self agenda, self interest, like relinquishing of self interest is the most, one of the most powerful things I've ever done. The more I get any self interest out of the space, again, the more amazing life is. Right? It's, it's not any, by the way, that's nothing complex about that. If you're playing on a competitive soccer team, you got to take your self-interest out of the way. That's what makes it work. It's not a complex thought, right? So there it was. And so what I had this experience beyond all the work of 25 years was just like, boom. And what was the next step? Well, the next step was beyond that was not getting somewhere. It was being harmony. And, it, and another way of saying it is who I am is not disharmony. Because, and I saw that like in all, in many in my decades of work, like pe people would have me, hey, would you just, they, people would give me offices just so I would go work in that environment because wherever I work, things function better because I just, I'm not disharmony. Where unworkability is, I just got to sort it out. It's just, I don't know how to explain it. It's uh, so, but, but you can see that yourself. You can see that in where you have this natural passion. If you're like just a neat person or this or that, you just put things, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. so, and, that's way deeper than the little surface levels of strengths that we have. But what I really experienced deeply in that moment has been reinforced, like when we go to the Sierra with the Mamos and everything, is that actually I have a view that, that the entire system in nature is designed for harmony. It's what it keeps wanting. And if you see, not even, I mean, if you look at even what we call it this or a tragedy or a fire, if nature causes a fire, it's balancing something in the planet. It grows new growth. You want to, it's just... It's always restoring the system. And if we get ourselves centered and clear, we actually don't have to work it. We are it. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. okay. So harmony. So my view is and what I'm up to is, is the restoration of the natural state of the, of the earth and the earth concludes us. And my view of it is, that the earth is one organism and we're cells in that organism. It's not us and the earth. It's kind of funny, the idea of, ah, oh, there's us and the earth. There was no us without the earth. <laughs> so that's like saying, oh, there's a, a skin cell and me. <laughs> 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 you know? It's kind of absurd. Skin yeah. cell walks off. I'm going to be my own thing. <laughs> and see you, <laughs> see you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> so... So for me, the, the like harmony, it, what we call harmony is a natural state. And I even challenge that because even the word drops it to something smaller than what it is. Right. But it's the best word I have. It's funny the way he talks about this makes me think of how you talk about your experience and mirror consciousness. But you both have arrived at where you've arrived in completely different ways. Yeah, it just interjects a little bit also. Um, I just had an interview a couple of days ago or so, and and it's been like three times in a row, th my three latest interviews, where people ask, "How can we? How can we? Do you have any tips how we can create peace on Earth?" And I basically gave them the same answer, which is, "You can't. Like you can't create peace on Earth. It's already the case. You just gotta stop doing what you're doing. You gotta stop fighting." And when we get ourselves out of the way, which I think is one of the main things that we should develop right now, if the topic, if the topic is to restore or to allow the natural state of harmony and balance to return, 
to this planet, including the consciousness of mankind, including nature, including animals, so all that, including ecosystem and weather, and then it is very important because in a sense we are, yes, we are the earth, but we're also shepherds. Like we have, yes and no, but we have also, in a sense, you could say risen to a position of influence, right? Yep. We've ri risen to a position, we are cells in the body, but at the same time, you could say we're brain cells instead of like skin cells. You know? We have risen to a position of shepherding. So inseparable from that system, we are, and yet we have sort of a, without the self-importance being inserted into it, we do have an important or valuable uh, position in that. So whatever we change at a consciousness level, uh, humanity, which is what I focus my work on, uh, will have an effect on the entire planet. Mm -hmm. Like when I, when I was looking at what do I wish to really dedicate my work to? What do I wish to dedicate my speech to, my body, my, my everyday energy, my concentration? Looking at all the different kinds of challenges and issues people experience, different forms of suffering, and but also indeed the suffering we sort of inflict upon the planet. Um, my conclusion fairly quickly was that the root cause of virtually all of it is human consciousness. So I wanted to work directly with the human consciousness because I saw that that is probably the thing that's going to have the most impact in the end, because mm -hmm. any project that's governed to restore the balance of the earth, even on a physical, like uh, by implementing a new system or regenerative, like some of the stuff we've been talking about, right? How do we create regenerative systems? All that will be produced by human consciousness. Um, all our errors will stop when human consciousness realizes the peace, the natural state of harmony. That's already the case. And I like the analogy you used um, with the dog and all that, because there is no, if, if nobody fights, then there are no fights. It's really, really that simple. So how do we create peace on earth? It just becomes another way of fighting. Like let's, let's fight to create peace on earth. And it's such a big trend in the world right now, all the social uh, movements and all the social fights in the name of justice, in the name of harmony, in the name of balance. Totally. Uh, and it just continues to perpetuate it because it's not the natural state. It's not the nothingness that is allowed to breathe, so to speak. Earth needs to kind of breathe through the space of nothingness, but we're not giving it that space of nothingness. We just keep filling it up with our biases and our biases evolve over time. But one could say, maybe not even for the better. Our biases are evolving, they're changing. But I'm not so sure that all of our biases are evolving for the better or towards that natural state. So there's evolution happening, but where is it going? Right? <laughs> um, whereas no evolution, or at least being able to tap into that state of emptiness, uh, emptiness of self interest, as Anurag called it, then what reveals itself to every living cell that does this, every cell that's sort of in stasis, or that's in like, rest, in natural vibration, natural harmony, what is revealed to any portion of the overall collective system is that harmony, that harmonious impulse that's naturally there. We are already at peace. There is no peace is not something we can ever create. Harmony is not something we can ever create. It's already the case that we're just not noticing it. And we're not tapping into it. And we're just creating a whole lot of other shit inside of this harmony, so that the harmony in a sense never has a chance to manifest. With, at the rate that we're filling it up with, with our own stuff. So, and this, this really is the main thing that I mean, there's a lot of things I like about Unrock and that we resonate with. But the main thing that drew me in that was like a resonance um, signal for me was sensing his dedication to helping people free themselves of themselves yeah. of their self interest, right? That's really sort of um, one of the main overlaps in our work is like, let's get over ourselves. And how can we do that? We can do it in funny ways, playful ways, we can do it in serious ways, harsh ways, we mm -hmm. can do it in kind ways, subtle ways, and then just to play with that balance and, and try out different methodologies and different balances and see what works. And One thing you guys have in common in terms of weights, another thing that you guys have in common, I just realized is your, um, your knack for offending people, or going the sort of controversial route to shake nice. people out of this stuff. Let's assume then for a second, like without getting arrogant or without trying to be, let's assume that maybe 
What if that is actually the result of having your self interest be out of the way? Like what if what if what if that which we have in common is to empty ourselves out of self interest, and ironically, or coincidentally, how that expresses itself in our work with people is that we rub people the wrong way, or that we seem controversial, or that people get pissed off. Why is that a common denominator or common factor? And, and this harkens back on an episode we did on authenticity and that I call leaders and celebrities and spiritual teachers out on the fact that they care so much about their self image, they care so much. And don't get me wrong, like I tailor all this, right? There's a difference between being deliberate about how you put forth your message, versus putting your self interest inside of that. There's vast difference, you, you can create a painting, according to your perfectionistic vision and have it be free of self-interest or it can be a messy painting and it is filled with self-interest yeah, and, right. and you know, all kinds of combinations. So what if there is something in there? What if there's a common denominator between those who actually somehow manage to empty themselves to a great extent anyway of self-interest, if they're working with people, if they're a public person, if, if they have a message or teaching, what if those people are simply more likely to rub people the wrong way or to trigger the egos and so on. I think it is personally. Um, and again, that's something that I recognized in Anurag, especially once I saw him work with other people. I recognized that he doesn't care if there's backlash on his mm -hmm. person, on his persona. And to me, that, that, that sells me on a person because A, I know the courage that it takes to do that the authenticity that it requires. And for me, that demonstrates that's almost like 99% of the time when that's the case, which is assuming that I've met 100 people that have done that. And it's not the case, but <clears throat> out of the <laughs> out of the five or so people that I've met in my life that I've sensed that from, um, you know, there is what that means if someone's able to do that. And it's hard to even describe what it is, right? But it's a sense that you develop once you do it yourself. So in a sense that in Iraq, and what that also signifies for me immediately, what it almost always proves is that they've done a shit ton of self inquiry. They've done a, a shit ton of investigative work within themselves, hmm. because you can't arrive. You cannot arrive at a place where you're able to do that uh, without being a psychopath, <laughs> or having done a whole lot of this work. And let's get clear on what exactly it is. So it's, it's, being able to rub people the wrong way while being of service to them. Can I say it a little differently? No. Yeah, go ahead. That's not exactly what I mean. Although that's okay. one of the expressions of it. But. See, consider another way of saying it is being straight. Right. <laughs> <laughs> See, we don't get up and go, hey, let's piss people off. <laughs> right. Now, does that reliably happen? Yes, you, do, you, have, you have seen that, but there's not a strategy to do that. But if you look, Almost all of communication that's happening in the world is designed to produce an effect or to avoid an effect, to produce a, an, uh, an emotional response, whether you're to avoid an anger, to produce a happiness, right? All those, what do you get what I'm saying, right? We don't mm -hmm. want to upset people. We don't want to disappoint them, whatever it is, right? So we lie. Subtly or explicitly, right? So if I'm actually going to say how it, listen, Lao Tzu said, because of deep love, one is courageous. Yeah. If you have a child and the child said, I want candy for every meal, you go, no. And they go, I hate you. And you go, I got it. It's fine. And you still know. And you piss them off. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. They're running in front of a car. You yell because you're fighting for their life. You don't care how they think of you. So, you know, there's no you here. You're, you're over there saying what you think will make the most difference. It's just being straight. Now, why does it piss people off? Because they spent time, their life avoiding that mm -hmm. and then building up a reason not to look at that. But then if they're there, they're at least to some level saying, I want to break through that. Well, then, you, you know, do you not say something? That'd be like saying, you come to me as a trainer and say, I want to get into shape. And I, I don't want to give you any exercises that make you sweat or not feel good. And what kind of trainer am I? Am I going to reach into you and pull you to your best, even when you don't feel like doing another sit-up? 
that's fine. You can hate me. I want to kill you. If you ever work with a trainer, sometimes you're like, oh, I, I'm going to, you know, like, you bastard. <laughs> but you know why you're there, right? I think a lot of people have the same um, affection or interest in this harmony that you were describing before. But it sounds like what you're doing, both of you, is actually compromising the short-term harmony that you could get by just uh, sort of diffusing a situation. No, I mean, I would say that's not harmony. That's a lie. The short-term, I mean, no, there's a disruption. There's no... The, the state of, of dissonance, of lack of coherence, the state of lie, that's not harmony. Mm -hmm. Do you get what I'm saying? Totally, but it can cause an even greater disharmony. So you're, no, you, you do have a long-term... <laughs> right. I would, I would, I would, I would not agree with that. I would say... It's disruption of disharmony. The disruption is of the disharmony. It doesn't cause a greater disharmony. It, causes, it might cause an upset, but that is not... Cool. That upset up here is, is the tip of the iceberg to the massive disharmony. There would be no upset if there wasn't a massive disharmony down there to get triggered. Cool. Do you get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, but, but exactly the way that you spoke it is why it looks like we piss people off, right? And, and, and that's, you know, it's, but no, nobody said what we're doing is creating, is, is creating alignment where there is an alignment, which means moving things from where they were to somewhere else, which is a disruption, right? But then you have to, but people are there. Oh, I want something different than what I have. And they're like, oh, I want something different, but I don't want to do anything different. So <laughs> what, what, what do you want, right? I'm going to take you to your word. If you come and say, listen, I'm up for the game. I want to move forward. Okay. So that would be, other, otherwise you would say, if I'm your trainer and I give you exercises that make you uh, uncomfortable, I'm not increasing the disharmony. Yes, it feels like this, you're out of breath. You, are you in a disrupted state from when you're sitting at your desk or lying on your couch? Yes, but there's no disharmony there. Do you get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. there's, there's an elevation towards harmony. Mm -hmm. And it feels quite disruptive and chaotic, but that doesn't mean it's less harmonious. There's plenty of chaos in nature, actually. And then to be really rigorous, those are just words we made up. <laughs> chaos and all that other stuff, right? You know, you have to just look at lots of uh, noise, a storm or whatever, or a fire in the forest created in the natural state isn't disharmony. It's just doing exactly what it needs to do, right? right? A, a lion chasing an antelope and killing and eating it is not disharmony, but it's quite chaotic and violent, mm -hmm. but we wouldn't go, oh, that's off, right? right. We would go, oh yeah, that's, that's natural. Right. Completely in nature and harmony, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to watch our prejudices and our predispositions to view things a particular way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm curious why you, why you say that this uh, realization indicates a lot of self-investigation. My view is that everybody ultimately arrives at the same conclusion experientially if they take it far enough. So if I see the embodiment of such conclusion in said entity, to me, that means they've done the work in different ways, but they've done the work to get to that essential realization or conclusion. Otherwise, they couldn't express with the courage. And, hmm. and even to call it courage is a little off because... It only mm -hmm. requires courage when it's not your natural realization, when it doesn't have your full allegiance, right? 100%. And it's not a bad thing. Like if you require courage to do something, that's great. That's a great step along the way. But more and more, you'll find it doesn't take courage. Like when we're on stage and we accidentally piss somebody off, of course, we realize it could happen when we're about to say the following thing, this or that. Um, but it's, again, like he said, it's not a strategy. It's not the intention to create a sensation of disharmony in someone, even though, like we've just discussed, it's not. It's just disruption of disharmony that's been crystallized, like turned to ice, right? Disharmony turned to ice looks quite ordered, orderly, right? And therefore, <laughs> <laughs> if you break the ice with the ice pick where you start melting it and it starts flowing, then, ooh, people get all like disrupted. It's, it's not disharmony. Anyway, we've covered that, but it's just, I mean, once you're, the, once you, 
once you get there to at least a certain degree, once you penetrate those levels, you can just begin to recognize the people that are sincere and authentic in that way, and that have made this their natural way of being and living. And so authenticity is hard to come by, but you smell it when you smell it, once you know what it smells like. And for me, it almost always means, unless someone's just kind of born and they never got polluted with the terminology screen and with like this whole crystallization of, which is rare, but other than that, if I see a grown up adult who's been through stuff and they've like started businesses, you know, and they've been through relationships and all that, I just know they've had to had done the work, which takes courage. Doing the work is what takes courage. The end result and then how you express yourself less and less takes courage because mm. it becomes natural. But doing the work to get there, it requires you to prioritize something. Which is another way of saying the same thing is mm -hmm. I saw in Anurag prioritization of the things that matter over selfishness. And so that's what takes courage for a lot of people because it's unfamiliar. They don't know if it's going to lead to the results that they've been taught and they've adopted, and they've conditioned themselves to believe they wish to get at. By the way, a lot of our desires, the vast majority of our desires are just vain ones. They're not actual needs, they're not actual inspirations, they're not actual desires. So a lot of this work is about also distilling, filtering out all that nonsense, so people can arrive at the essential state of harmony, which is the natural condition of all things, including the planet, including human consciousness, just like when we sleep at night, ah, we're at peace, because we're not there to make a fuss. <laughs> right? When we're in deep sleep, oh, we wake up and we're like, I had such a natural restful state. And then we add our stuff again, we, mm -hmm. we add our language, we add our definitions and our biases, and we create this harmony again. This is why we need so much sleep also often. It's because we create so much stuff and the system responds to all that and it needs to detox it. So it just means someone would have had to pause themselves relentlessly over and over again, if they're a normal human being with normal thoughts and normal self deceiving, you know, the 10,000 layers of self deception that we carry that's 10,000 layers of language and bias and assumption. If someone can express themselves naturally without fear of how others respond to that. And there's people that do that, but they're doing it for self gain. That's right. different, right? There's people that just like say whatever they want, but it's because they just want to make money. And that's their only intention, for example, right? That's different. Like there's another quality there. Um, this is when you're actually in service to others, and your aim is to help people transform themselves and arrive at that natural state. If you're able to do that without fear of how people perceive you, then for the most part, it means someone has done the work. Mm -hmm. And that to me, earns, earns, uh, earns their respect in me like immediately, because I know what it takes, I know the courage that it requires, I know the relentless effort that is required. And so then there is a natural kinship, like we didn't need to talk much. Yep. There's just natural kinship, because there's recognition of sincerity in the intention and self investigation with every intention that arises. Um, hmm. And you can you I don't know, you just smell it. After all, you just smell it. Is that how you feel too? 100% they concur with all of that. Wow. Yeah, it's exactly my experience of it as well. So, but you guys have done such different work. Like, I feel like if I just rewound each of like doing the work from scratch. Yeah, totally different paths. But that actually for me even validates it further because you have this intention and, and completely different starting points and different paths still led us to the same place. That's how you know, that's, that's part of the, you did this way, this way, it's just like doing experiments, you know, multifaceted test and control, and it takes you back to the same place. Cool. We just need one more person and we can triangulate the truth. <laughs> That's right. Cool. Well. Okay. So interesting would be interested to know about like what, what it is right now in general that you're helping people with. I mean, I know that's a, a there, there's tons of people that you're working with, but if you could sort of simplify it, like what are people coming to you for and what's your process with them? Well, people are coming for me for, for lots of different things, but I only give them one thing, <laughs> so it doesn't matter. So, Which is uh, why they get pissed off. <laughs> 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 this is not what I came here for. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, it's all I have to that's offer. That's all I got. Um, so let's look at a couple of things. So first of all, 
there's um as we as some people know there's first of all dealing with where you're full of shit right because almost every, almost uh, this is one of the ways that I'm quite direct and people deal with but I tell people that you're actually not coming for what you say you're coming for kind of funny because when you ask it another time what's in the way of people who are seeker seeking and what's the way is that they're seeking is <laughs> one way of looking at it what do you mean well, again, it's the thing I talk to everybody, whether they're seeking, they're seeking for help in the place to get to where you actually get, there's nowhere to get. There's, you know, that's, mm -hmm. it's the seeking. Here's like this. They want to reach this state of peace and calm and acceptance and presence, right? But what, where they're coming from is this isn't it. There's somewhere to get. But the only way to get that is to get that this is in fact it. Now, if you say this isn't it, there's something else and then it'll be it, then you have absolutely defined that this can't be it and therefore you will not be at peace here hmm. do you get what i'm saying mm -hmm. if any if any part of your life say you say this is not it when i get there when i get more enlightened when i get this when i meditate better when i double my business whatever then that'll be it uh-huh you get what i'm saying yeah if you say then that'll be it then you're why by definition saying that this is not it and you so thereby seeking you are saying that this is not it you get any okay yeah but you've been just like a <laughs> ruthless seeker your whole no, life no? i know that's what see people can't see it any other way that's the funny part of it <laughs> so well, here's what's interesting right so one one of the things so let me let me add some dimensions to this dialogue so even though, because it's, I don't know how to language another way, so people talk about this. Yes, I spent years in personal development, all this stuff, but that's not what I'm doing anymore. But people don't know where else to catalog it. But I hit the top of, I hit, you know, like kind of the end of that world where I was doing this, I was leading, and I was training trainers, training trainers, and it was there's still something missing. And then I finally got it. It's the end of the paradigm is when you get it, when you're of service, life is, let me ask you this. You know, every time you know that you've made a difference with somebody else, right? and you know you've made a difference in the quality of their life, how does mm -hmm. that feel? Great. Amazing, right? Mm -hmm. I've asked probably 30 or 40,000 people that question around the world. Not one person has said anything other than, ah, oh, it's amazing. Even guys who got out of jail were gang members who go, even if they just helped but another gang member, in that moment, they go, yes, right? Okay, good, so do you wanna feel that way all the time? Mm -hmm. Good, all you need to do then is make a difference. If making a difference, being of service, always has you feel that way, why don't you, how complicated is that math? So I can have people get, do they change? No. <laughs> do they, so, but here's the deal, right? So the thing is, then I got the limitation of the paradigm that I was working in, which is that it's personal development. As long as it was the personal development world or the self-help, whatever, it's personal in itself. Interesting, good point. Right? So I was like, oh my God, I can't do that anymore. It's now society development, earth development, whatever you want to call it, right? Good but call. Oh my, as long as I <laughs> put it in that, right? Yeah. It's, it's done. So... <clears throat> so the thing is, yes, there was a there was a period of time that I was a seeker until I got that there's nothing to seek. There's just playing the game full out. If you love what you if you love your game, if you love playing soccer, you play. The joy is in the game. Literally, I feel the joy is in the in the in the effort. I've actually done this work in the last year where I thought, like, you know, I've talked to sometimes about um how people have given effort a bad name, but you know, if you're an excellent skier, you don't like an easy hill, you know, if you, you know, mm -hmm. if you play soccer and you won 10 nothing easily, you wouldn't play, you want to be challenged. And so that's, I found that's part of it. I've recently gone to a place where I think actually it's all of it. Mm -hmm. I've worked closely, I've examined things. And if people, if you put a full effort into cleaning your closet, you feel great. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You bring yourself forth fully. So, so part of it is, is that here's the simple math. Every time you are of service, you're, all, you're left fulfilled and joyful. And it's not complex, but the thing is, is that you, you don't do it for yourself. <laughs> so it's... Um, do you see... Um, Remember when I talked, this was on a different episode, when I talked about the importance of what I call polarity or building up that charge, that yeah. metaphysical charge. So he's talking about things also like 
um, that there's nothing to find and stuff. But as you read his energy, you can see that he's been activated before, right, like for totally. a long period yeah. of time. So he has built up that charge. So there's a, there's this, um, there's a spiritual electricity, if you will, behind whatever he's doing or not doing. Mm -hmm. So there's a deliberateness. There's, he has polarized in a direction, in this case of service to others, to use my terminology, he's polarized in the direction of service to others. He's built momentum energetically. Therefore, he has the ability to use his will, his, his free will, his attention, his consciousness, his deliberateness in a certain direction, including the direction of no direction which is different than when teachers say things like, oh, there's nobody here, it's not about you. But the people that they're talking to or the teacher themselves have just adopted a new language. Mm -hmm. And and it sucks the seeking. And in one of the episodes, what I said is don't trust any guru over your gut feeling seeking impulse. Like, because that's your lifeline to the creator. That's your lifeline to source. You, you got to stay true to that seeking energy and don't be afraid to even amplify it. But when people try to fall into a, a new language of um, of selflessness and so forth, but without putting forth that in this case, you could translate it as effort too, as a work, mm -hmm. as polarity, as charge, as bringing that momentum over and over again, relentlessly, and you're building up upon that, then you're gaining this, you're gaining this spiritual mass, if you will. Mm -hmm. Then you have the, then certain concepts can break open into powerful realizations that are, and experiential embodiments, which is different than mm -hmm. someone that's just sort of parroting a certain language mm -hmm. and they're making certain things right and wrong. Right. And now to seek is no longer right. And therefore people become these numb things. Oh, oh no, this is seeking. Let me stop seeking. No, no, no. There's gotta be, there's gotta be passion. There's gotta be the activation of that spiritual quality within yourself. Mm -hmm. I definitely gotta, add, yeah. So don't take what I'm saying is like, oh now seeking is right. And then, or seeking is wrong are two sides of the same thing. It's not, right. not that at all. See, if you, if in, it's about the love of the game. I love the game. The inquiry, like, so this is about playing the game of your aliveness, of your presence, of your joy. So if you ski or if you climb a mountain or if you play soccer, or even if you do a crossword or play music, you don't do it to get to the end. Right. You do it because you love doing it. Nice. So it's about living life in that game, not because when I get there. So th that there's still this activity of what people, people could look at me and say, you're seeking. No, I love, I love the depth, the exploration, <laughs> the joy of the game of living. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But not because I'm going to get somewhere and that'll be it, because the way that I play it right now gives me life. Cool. That reconciles it for me actually right there. Yeah. Yeah. Great. yeah. And so what happens is, and why I stopped leading a lot of traditional workshops and stuff was people would show up and whether they're hearing seek or don't seek, they're still hearing it in order to something linear later. And then you have many, so I'm going to say from my view, like many quote teachers like that, who are then harvesting that desire in order to also further their own ends of filling seats and chairs. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. And some are not, but, and I couldn't, I, that was just not, a, I'm not interested in that. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? It was just uh, yeah, it's just the end game for me in that world. So then, you know, what I want with my whole heart is people get, they got everything right now. And if you were to align, if you were to live with honor, if you were to take on yourself and live from a place and because call it live your calling or do the right thing every moment, you'll be wherever you are. But you'll, you'll, that full thing that you're wanting is will be alive right now and you'll do it every moment for the rest of your life. And all it takes is being willing to live with honor right now. Not to learn more and then maybe live with honor later. That's the thing that I got. Mm -hmm. Oh, people are learning this and they're applying it sparingly and they've got all these attachments and bullshit and out integrity that they don't want to let go of right now and their attachments. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, but they'll do little bits of progress and so they can get there later to justify keeping attachments right now. But I could go to them. I've done this. I've said, okay, if I, you, oh, you can't, you're struggling with this and that. Okay, if I gave you a million dollars to stop that, would you stop? Yes, I would. So you can. Do <laughs> you get what I'm, you know? Mm -hmm. So it, it's no, people could slow down, you know? <laughs> and I've been, <laughs> so all, all the best of my work is now 180 degrees the opposite of the what I used to do, which was you know, very linear. And I, I'm, I've been working with people on, Let's do, um, you know, I help people build in the business world, really successful growth and stuff like that. 
Now I'm interested in helping people reduce their businesses. I'm looking at a business reduction program. Really? Yeah. <laughs> people grow, 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 and they're like just they're just they're completely formed by this desire to grow and all of this, and they got and they and they have no quality of life or an okay quality of life or whatever. But then I go, oh, let's uh, reduce the size of your business or let's actually keep it the same, but then hire somebody else and take you out of it and just take the income uh, a third less, but have you just love what you're doing every single day of your life. You know, what if we could stop, reduce it to something that you actually spend just the amount of time that you love doing only what you love and living every day the way that you love. And I like to say this is a business reduction program just to just get people just the disruption. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. Know? Who gives a fuck? Like, <laughs> nice. what are you, I want to keep growing. Like we were talking about it, guys with millions and then billions going for more. Why? <laughs> One of the funniest interviews I ever saw was the guy who founded Alibaba. And uh -huh. he's worth so many billions of dollars. And he's on there talking about this. Yeah, it's so much work and managing this business. And I, well, why do you keep doing it? You're an idiot. <laughs> I, used, I have this thing. When I used to do my business workshop, I called it the idiot clause. All these people sitting in the workshop. And they would go, and they're like, they're, I'm struggling with this, and I'm stressed by this. And I go, okay, whose business is it? Mine. Who created it? I do. <laughs> Who's keeping it? Me. Who's it stressing me? Okay, you're an idiot. <laughs> I mean, how complicated is that? Right? That's like watching a TV show you don't like and keep complaining. Instead of changing the channel. Do you get how absurd that is? Yeah, totally. And I have, I have, I have uh, compassion. I was, I had a businessman, and I was used by the environmental program or whatever you want to call it. Of this is the right. I've got to do this. But actually, you don't. And when people really get, oh, I don't have to. I could say no to another contract. You don't have to. You don't actually have to do more. You don't have to grow. Why are you doing that? What kind of demand do you have for a business reduction class? What's that? What, what kind, kind of, of demands do you have? Like, do people, are people even aware that that's something that they want? No, that's the thing when you asked earlier, when people come to me with what they want, and I say, that's cool. not what you really want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I go, why do you want that? Why do you want, well, because I want this. I mean, why? Because I want more money. Why? Because I want this. And well, I go, well, why? Because in order to be happy and fulfilled. Okay, well, let's work on that. <laughs> in order that, well, let me give you, i give two examples real quick, right? One of them is, in Vancouver, I used to work with this group of companies and, and then, you know, then work with them as a group and then one-to-one. -one. And this one guy who's an architect came to me and said, okay, I want to double my business. So I worked out a plan for that and we started to work on it well, month after month and no progress. And I, if, if people apply my stuff, it worked. And I go, I have a thing. If it's, if it's not happening, it must not be your intention. So I go, okay, it must not be your intention. So let's really dig into it. So we dug into it and he discovered, you know, it, sorry, it became clear. That his intention, what he really wanted was to sp spend more time with his kids, mountain bike more, and travel more. So there's no growing business. Our success in that project ultimately was to have his business, his architecture business, reduced from 2.2 million to 1.2 million, reduce his staff from eight to three to only doing work that he loves to do, and to having way more time to go where he wants to go. Right? Oh, yeah. So the other one is this, this is a general thing, but I'll give you one specific example. So you know, when I was talking and, you know, I was talking to Dennis earlier about language and everything about, and so I started to get that everything is a myth. Richard and I were working out, hey, this is a myth of this, a myth of that. Then I go, I think everything's a myth. So here's one thing I call the myth of performance, right? So um, I did this workshop in Vancouver with Richard and there was these uh, couple of young guys they had a top notch, like a little kick-ass little marketing firm in Los Angeles, right? Did the workshop, they went back and they called us a year later. They said, this has been amazing. You know, we've grown from 60 to $18 million over the course of a year. We just landed Nike basketball as a client, which is outrageous because no Nike basketball doesn't go for a firm their size. They go for a large national firm. They were subcontractors of that firm, but Nike liked them so much. They dropped it down, pissing off the big firm. But you know, it's, they're like on fire. We want you to come in house and do work with our team. So we went to this place, we got like 40 people and I'm listening and I'm you know, preparing for it and I go, oh, I see something missing here. So um, the myth of performance. So every, I said, okay, everybody, so tell me, so I'm gonna talk to you about performance and, I, you know, and the myth of it, right? So let me shorten the conversation a little bit. So I, I did an inquiry, what is performance? And you, an increase in performance, everybody agreed that at some level you could say, 
it's a increased output of what you want per unit input of something, mm -hmm. right? Like miles per hour or this for that, or, you know, you know, dollars in a year, whatever, right? Can you get that? Like, mm -hmm. so you have, if you have an increase in performance, you have some input of effort, time, resource, and more output. Yeah? Yep. Okay, cool. So I said, okay, great. We're aligned on that. Yes. So then I threw up a little chart. I said, okay, let's look. So let's look at what your performance was. So I said, so you had, they go, oh yeah, tripled. We went from six to 18 million. I said, well, I don't think, I have a disagreement. I think you reduced by about 67%. They're like, well, okay, good. So what, what did you get more of? You got money, but why did you want more money? I mean, who cares? You go, well, this, so well, so we can have more things we want. Well, why do you want more? What kind of things do you want? I want this and what, I can buy a house and have a car, this. Why? You want, so we did a few cycles of that. Ultimately, what people came to is, what is more, if the outcome is more of what you want, what they ultimately wanted was, they wanted more happiness and more joy. You get that? So, okay, so you have <laughs> this much input per that much output. So, okay, good. So happiness and joy. I've been interviewing you guys for a while. And as far as I can tell, you have actually slightly less happiness and joy than a year ago. You're th you got much, three times as much work. You got Nike basketball. You're working harder, a little less time with the family, a little less health. You know, you're kind of excited about it. But let's even call it even. Not less. Let's call it even, right? So now, why I say you've had a 67% reduction in performance? Because it now takes three times as much money to make you the same amount happy that you were a year ago. That's the math. Cool. Mm -hmm. Like, that's the straight math. Nobody pays attention to it, but that's the simple math. So then when people come, I go, well, let's really look at what you're after here. Because mostly people are multiplying their businesses and in the purest sense of the word, destroying their performance. That's my take on it anyways. Mm -hmm. And also that really messes with people to which I kind of enjoy a little. <laughs> <laughs> I remember you telling me that you're invited back to fewer places than. Yeah, than anyone I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's good. Yeah, you're probably you probably beat me on that one. <laughs> Maybe, huh? I thought my disinvitation list was pretty high. But, <laughs> but, the, but the thing is... Your, but then, your performance in that field is yeah, so yeah. yeah. So, but the thing is, but what I'm committed to, the thing is, is that if you're really committed to the heart of people, then you got to get that stuff said. Yeah. Right? Go, listen. Otherwise, it would be like, I'm allowing you to keep running and running and running and onto the road in front of the car. Why would I do that? I'm going to yell and say, don't. Keep doing that. Let's look at what you really want and what's the most of... And I'm not saying I don't... I'm not going to help a person grow their business, but, you know, inside of the current model, it's about a business is, there is, is an entity that they use to cause their heart to flourish and to make a difference because the more difference they make... And so if it grows, it'll grow as a function of... In, of, of having their heart fully expressed in the world. But it'll always be right. If you, if you work at where you're coming from versus where you're going to, it'll settle like nature into its appropriate size. That's my experience anyways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Mirror Talks podcast with Bentinho Massaro. If you love these teachings and you want full access to almost all of Bentinho's recorded material, go to bentinomasaro.tv. Right now, we're offering a free seven-day trial with unlimited access to everything on bentinomasaro.tv, including curated playlists, guided meditations, and much more. This is our number one recommendation for you. As a subscriber, you'll get first access to these podcast episodes two weeks before they go public. You'll also get access to exclusive Q&As with Bentinho and other content only available to subscribers of BentinhoMassaro.tv. Also, Bentinho recently created a free online global enlightenment retreat. It's eight long form sessions that coherently guide you through the foundation of his enlightenment teachings. You can watch the free online global enlightenment retreat at BentinhoMassaro.tv or on YouTube. If you're interested in the most current and complete overview of Bentinho's work to date, this is where we recommend you start. Another great resource is Trinfinity Academy, Bentinho's free online school for enlightenment, empowerment, and infinity. Each class is concise and clear and distills one key topic at a time, including homework. We strongly recommend you check out Trinfinity Academy if you want to master the mechanics of Bentinho's teachings. Finally, don't underestimate the value of sharing this episode with the people who came to mind as you were watching or listening. 
It's a service to them and the collective, and it's also the best thing you can do to support us in getting this message far and wide. We also encourage you to like, subscribe, and leave positive reviews and ratings on your preferred platforms, and follow Bentinho on social media, especially Instagram. Thank you 